Ученые кадры запуска первого спутника. Наблюдавшим на старте казалось, вот сейчас семерка упадет. We are celebrating our 100th episode of Sputnik here at the Science Museum in London where they have a special exhibition on cosmonauts and we are going to enjoy a private viewing with the initiator and creator Dog Milad. Mr. Milad, I understand that we're standing in front of the Russian crown jewel. Could you tell us more about it? Absolutely. This is the actual spacecraft that took the first woman away from this planet. This is Valentina Tereshkova's Vostok 6, so one of the most important spacecraft on the planet at the moment. Tereshkova spent three days in space. She was strapped down to her ejector seat, her couch, and uh, she got a terrible cramp because she couldn't move. Her spacecraft was orientated the wrong way around, so she had to ask Mission Control to write it the, uh, the correct way, otherwise she would have uh, died in space. So it was, a, it was a difficult mission, but uh, very successful. I understand that she even came to the launch of this exhibition. How was it for her to, be, to see this? She did indeed, yes, and uh, she sees this occasionally in Moscow, and every time she passes it, she says she, she strokes it. She says it's her favourite man. And so where in Moscow is, uh, is this, would this otherwise be? Well, this is normally displayed, uh, it's a private collection in the Energia company, so this is not open to the general public. Uh, another reason why we're so fortunate and privileged to be able to show this to the public of uh, UK and also all of our international visitors. The response has been magnificent. Uh, it's everything that we hoped it would be. People realise that uh, we are showing something that is very special. It's all about humanity's relationship with space. It's something which transcends everything that goes on here here on Earth. It's, it's very, very popular. So especially in the current political climate, there is no... You manage to overcome this Cold War feeling toward Russia, basically, and the Soviet Union, then Soviet Union. Well, we've been working on this for four years, flat out, and from the word go, both governments have been extremely enthusiastic. We couldn't have done it without the support that we received, so this was something that we knew was going to be done. It was written in the stars, I suspect. <laughs> Well, this actually never made it, but it's incredibly striking, magnificent, actually. For someone of my age, this is what the space age looked like. This is what... Picture this landing on the lunar surface. Maybe Alexei Leonov coming down the steps. History could have been different. One giant step, he might have said, but in Russian. I wouldn't have understood it at the time. <laughs> <laughs> it is uh, magnificent. So one man would have been in there. Uh, why didn't it go? What, what happened? What went wrong? Well, they tested it in space and it was okay, but uh, the rocket that would have launched it to the moon, that had lots of problems, so it was never launched to the moon. That was the main reason. Must have been a crushing disappointment. How uh, narrowly ahead were the Russians in the race at that time? Well, in a way, they were, they were not managing to keep up uh, because Apollo had so much money, so uh, the resources were directed and clear. It wasn't the case in the Soviet Union. So you had all this amazing technology, but it wasn't all knitted together and directed mm. in a powerful direction like Apollo was. So, in fact, after Gagarin 
first man in space, after the first woman in space, first dogs in space. Uh, so around 1962-63, did the Russians start falling behind the US? What they were emphasizing were more headlines, more firsts, as you've just described. Mm -hmm. Meanwhile, Kennedy had said, we are going to go to the moon and the Apollo. By the end of the decade. By the end of the decade. And they were quietly going about doing that. So gradually they overtook the Soviets. Indeed. So what's the public reaction? I mean, when I came in there, I literally went, well, it literally uh, hit me in the face. Not many things nowadays do. Is that the normal public reaction? Absolutely, and I remember the first time I saw this, my reaction was exactly the same. This was secret until Glasnost under Mikhail Gorbachev, oh, yeah. 1989. We knew they were trying to get to the moon all those years earlier, but we didn't know exactly how. And then suddenly, at the end of the 80s, we, we started to see the technology. We know that Gagarin returned safely to Earth, as did Valentina. Many people will be wondering what happened to the dogs. Well, the first dog, Laika, didn't return, but she never was going to return. But many of the other dogs, particularly those launched uh, to trial Yuri Gagarin's type of spacecraft, they did come back successfully. Mm. And Belka and Strelka, uh, their successful return from orbit, that signaled the, um, the go-ahead for the Gagarin mission. Because then it was clear that biological life could Absolutely. go there yeah. and come back. That's right. The, only a non-scientist like me would ask the first question that occurred to me as a kid. How do they have a Ah, walk this way. Really? Oh my goodness. This is actually the, the, the full facilities for the Mir space station. So that's the um, fairly self-explanatory toilet. The solid waste goes into that container there. The urine goes via the hose into these canisters. There's a pump towards the end, which uh, is driven, uh, it's an electrical pump. Should that fail, then you have a hand pump there to make sure you get everything from there into the right places. The urine is then moved into another filtration unit, recycled into drinking water, oh, wow. potable really? water. Wow, yeah. wow. So it didn't get sprayed into space? It's uh, not orbiting no, round? No, they used to do that, but no longer. No longer. <laughs> Well, I can't believe you actually asked him that. I mean, he's the curator of uh, the exhibition, but I'm glad you did because I thought I was the only one who wondered that. Well, it could have been worse. I, I could have asked him how Valentina managed for three days <laughs> in that giant beach ball <laughs> in which she was circling the earth. But enough toilet humor. There's a few laughs here, I'm sorry to say. Gayatri took the camera and the famous red gloves onto the street outside and asked the people who was the first man in space? In space? Yeah. Oh. I know it's, Amer it's American, I guess, uh, but I don't know the name. No. In space? Yeah. Who will it be? Yeah, no, who was it? Who was it? The president in space? No idea. Oh my god, I don't know. I have no idea. <laughs> uh, Neil Armstrong? What about you? The same, I think. Yeah, uh, the, same, right? the same answer. Yeah? The first person in space? Yeah. Oh, this is one of those trick questions. <laughs> no, it's not. Well, I have to say I'm pretty rubbish with this stuff. I know that Armstrong was one of the first. He's probably not the first. Oh, Buzz Aldrin? Is it? Was it Buzz Aldrin? Well... I don't know. Maybe it was... it a Russian? <laughs> <laughs> I'm guessing. You got me. I it for you, yes. <laughs> Who was it? Yuri, Yuri, Yuri Gagarin. Yeah. From Russia, yes. Uh, Yuri Gagarin, was that? Uh, Yuri Gagarin, no. What a striking difference between the generations in consciousness about the space exploration business. One young man who knows everything there is to know is Anu Oja, OBE, Director of Education and Space Communications at the National Space Centre in Leicester. What a job to have and how lucky are we that he's on board the Sputnik for edition number 100. Anu, thanks very much for joining us. Were you as struck as me by the fact that all the older people knew uh, who the first man in space was and none of the younger people knew? Sounds like you've still got a bit of a job to do. Well, first of all, George, thank you for inviting me. It's a, a real privilege to be here. Thank you. Um, 
I mean, I'm, I'm not as young. You, you did me a great uh, service there. You know, I remember, I'm part of that generation that remembered the final landings on the moon in, in, in 1972. And although there is a bit of a generational split in, in terms of maybe understanding the background of, of the space age and where it was born from and what drove it, um, the fact remains that across the generations, you know, space is a unique trope that seizes the imagination. You know, what human being has not looked up at the night sky at some stage and wondered, you know, who am I? Where am I? Why am I here? And I think what space science has done and everything we've learned and benefited from from space resonates with everybody. So I'm not surprised to see the footage that you, 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 you had with the various interviews. But it also tells us what a powerful level of interest we can solicit if, we, if we're informing them more about the background and about the significance of those, those wonderful years in the 1960s and 1970s that really were the crucible of the space age. Indeed, uh, a very great man long before that, Oscar Wilde, said, we are all of us in the gutter, but some of us are looking up indeed. at the stars. Wonderful um, quotation. Uh, indeed. Um, the... 60s, because I'm even older than you, uh, was a truly magical period if you think about it. 59, you have the Sputnik, you have Gagarin, you have Valentina, all of which is captured in this wonderful uh, exhibition at the Science Museum. You have the Americans, their pride slightly injured, President Kennedy, God rest his soul, uh, promising that the Americans will reach the moon by the end of the decade and indeed it happened most people think though that it's kind of stilled since then has it certainly in terms of exploration with human beings you know the pinnacle of what we've achieved as a species were, were those wonderful missions between 1968 and 1972 when 24 human beings became the only members of humanity to, to reach another world and 12 of them walked on its surface, because that's what the moon is, an alien world on our doorstep. But in terms of what we've done since then, we've had space stations in space where human beings are living for months at a time, including the International Space Station. We've had satellites sent into space that have revolutionized our lives here on Earth. You know, I was the last of the generation that still had to wait for live media coverage from special events all over the world. We now take the fact that we live in a global village for granted, and it's only been possible by Earth's ring system of telecommunication satellites that have enabled the idea of almost... I think what's really important is by having satellites in space looking back at Earth, we're getting a better understanding of our Earth, its atmosphere, the oceans, and the potential effects of, of human activity on the environment. So space science is ingrained in all of our lives. Space services, you know, this data that we're getting, are essential to the way we live our 21st century way of life. And I suppose part of our major challenge is to make sure more people are aware of it and to make sure that we can keep pushing forwards in our desire to explore, but also our desire to better understand our home planet. Hold those thoughts. We'll be right back after this. Welcome back to Sputnik, orbiting the world for the 100th time with me, George Galloway, and Gayatri, otherwise known as Mrs. Galloway. A hundred times we've orbited the world, but we have never done so more interestingly than the conversation I'm having now with Anu Oja OBE, the director of Education and Space Communications at the National Space Center in Leicester. How's that for a title? How's that for a job? There's nothing this man doesn't know about space, and the rest of us are fascinated still by it, Anu. The uh, big question for me, uh, suppose it almost crosses the frontier into a philosophical question rather than a purely scientific one, but I mean, I know that you feel that this is a very special planet indeed. My question is, is it unique? Has there ever been a planet like us before? If so, what might have happened to it? And will our planet always be as it is now? What's your take on that? A major challenge, and I, I will try to, to really keep my answers focused in tightly. Um, 
The more we learn about other planets in, in our own solar system, George, the more we realize how special a place Earth is. You know, if I was an alien visitor coming from another solar system, uh, I would see Earth and be absolutely astonished. Here is a world teeming with life. You know, life on Earth for billions of years has changed the geology of our planet. It's changed the atmosphere of our planet. It's led to this astonishing diversity that's ultimately led to, to human civilization here. Are we unique? We don't know. The way Earth is now has not always been the case. If we go back in time four billion years, we would see that the planet Mars was much more Earth-like then. It was warmer, it was wetter, it had a thicker atmosphere, it had lakes, rivers, it had an ocean covering half of its hemisphere, half of, a, 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 of the planet. Absolutely, go three. So, you know, did life ever exist on Mars in the past? We don't know, but it's one of the major challenges that we're trying to, to, to really address because at the moment, although we are looking for life elsewhere in the universe, the only place where we know with absolute certainty it has ever started is here on planet Earth. And I, I firmly believe that the discovery of, of either evidence of past life somewhere else or evidence of current life will completely change not only the field of science, but also perhaps our own perspectives on, on human society and human yeah, culture. Absolutely. Religion, well, everything, you. Absolutely. Uh, everything would be affected uh, by that. As a matter, I'm an undereducated man, but it seems to me that as a matter of logic, out of all the planets in our solar system and all the solar systems that they, there are, that we know there are, it just seems illogical that one tiny little planet would be the only one in which life had ever flourished. What do you say to that? Well, we are, we are looking elsewhere, George, and again, within our solar system and in my lifetime, we have discovered worlds where, when I was a child, if you had told me that this is a potential target for us looking for life, I would have said, no way. This is the way that science has changed our understanding of the universe in my lifetime. So if I take one of Jupiter's moons, Europa, it's, a, it, it's an ice ball about the size of our own moon, but we, we're pretty confident now that underneath this icy outer crust, there is a salty ocean. And in that salty ocean, we may have the conditions for life. Barely 10 years ago, similar circumstances were found in an even smaller moon of Saturn's, a, a world called Enceladus, that, that's about the size of Wales. You know, when a, a mission called the Cassini mission, that's a European NASA mission, flew by, we saw these astonishing eruptions of, of liquid water coming from, from, from out of its icy crust. And so we are looking for life elsewhere in our own solar system. We're not probably going to find complex organisms. I could be wrong. We're looking for microbial life. But when we look further out, you know, even in our own galaxy, the Milky Way, we see 100,000 million other stars. We've had missions like the Kepler Space Telescope that's discovered thousands of other planets. We call them exoplanets orbiting other stars. Again, those discoveries hadn't been made five years ago. So if I was to say Earth is unique, um, at the moment, it is, but I'm confident we are well, going to find other planets. Unique only in our uh, understanding. Exactly. Uh, ditto the point you made uh, about uh, um, conditions for life. There are conditions for life as we know it, and we know those conditions and we know what life looks like. Uh, but of course, there may be other forms of life that flourish in entirely different uh, conditions. But can I run a stat just past you that you just used? I think you said there are thousands of millions of planets in our galaxy. Did you say so? Thousands of millions? There are 100,000 million stars in our galaxy. Uh, we know just amongst the local ones, well, I say local, I mean a few thousand light years away, there are thousands of planets we've discovered. Now, I talked about the stars in our galaxy. There are 100,000 million other galaxies in the universe, at oh. least. I mean, I've got so many questions. The numbers are too big. I've got so many questions. <laughs> no, but they're, they're I just want to tap on that light year, the light year that you mentioned, yeah. because this makes the whole exploration even more challenging. Because when you say light year, the way I understand it is when we look up at the stars, we are actually looking at the future. Because no, you're looking it's at the, the past. past. The past, see? Yeah. There you go. But it's a, it's difference. It's difference in time. I mean, that's quite a challenge as well. I mean, I, 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 it's just too much to grasp. Yeah, it's, it, if we use the numbers in miles or kilometers, we, we'd run out of zero. So, yeah. so very simply, light travels incredibly fast. Yeah. If, if I could get a beam of light to go around the Earth, yeah. seven and a half times in a second. So what we do is we use how long it takes light to travel 
certain distances to give us a measure of yeah. distance. So if I look at the moon, I'm seeing it as it was one and a quarter seconds ago. The sun, eight minutes. Pluto, five hours. The next nearest star, four years. So if I compare eight minutes to four years, I've got the distance to the sun, to the next nearest star. And this is where the concept of the light year comes in. Unbelievable. As you gaze up at all of this, literally and metaphorically, as you do in your daily life, is it your view that it's all an accident, that it all just happened, that all this came from nothing? To, to be honest, George, I don't know. Um, what I find incredibly powerful is that as human beings, we can create an intellectual framework which can try to model not only what we see, but try to predict what will happen. So science works in this way. You can have a wonderful theory, but it remains a theory until you get some evidence that either dis disproves you or supports your case. Uh, what I find astonishing is when I look up at the night sky, the number of other stars that are there, you know, there's a, a fundamental calculation we can do with, with, with high school students that, that, that show with the, some of the images we have from the Hubble Space Telescope that there are more stars in the universe than grains of sand on all the beaches of planet Earth. Now, that is mind-blowing. Definitely. Yeah. So one part of me says, when I look out there, surely there must be life. Then I ask myself, well, where did that life come from? There are two ends of the spectrum. There are some chemists who can talk about the possibility of how through random... And, um, you know, it'll probably sound like I'm dodging the question, but I honestly no. don't have enough data to, to go one way or the other. But from my perspective, I'm just astonished at, at the diversity that we see in the universe. And I suppose what myself and, 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 and other people are trying to do is, is trying to understand why, but also its significance for us now in the way we live our lives here on Earth. Uh, of course, we could discuss for another day or five uh, all of this. Um, Mars, am I right in saying, is the, is the next big prize. It's the next big planet that is as like us as we're going to find and therefore on which life may have once uh, or even now uh, be present. In terms of human space flight, this is our long-term goal. So in three weeks' time, and I think it's a wonderful example of international cooperation, we, we have a British astronaut, uh, Tim Peake, flying for the European Space Agency. He's launching with a Russian commander, Yuri Malenchenko, uh, and a NASA astronaut, Timothy Kopra, launching from Kazakhstan on a Russian spacecraft to the International Space Station. And they're oh, going to spend wonderful. five months in orbit. So why do we do this? Because if we are to go further in the solar system, if we're ultimately to go to the planet Mars, we're going to have a journey time away from Earth, not of months, but of years. And if we want to learn about how to keep human beings alive in space for such a long period of time, how to have the culture where human beings can deal with any in-flight emergencies that may arise, okay. something like the International Space Station is absolutely key. And, and I'm confident that, you know, if we look ahead to the next 20 years, you know, right now, in primary and secondary schools around the world, there are a number of students, including perhaps in the United Kingdom, who have no idea that in 20, 25 years, they're going to be part of an international mission that will be the first human mission to Mars, and they'll be taking humanity's next giant leaps. Um, what they will find when they get there, who knows? Perhaps we will answer, ultimately, by getting humans on Mars, whether or not the planet ever had life and whether or not primitive life still exists below the surface. So it's, it's, it's a noble aspiration to go. It is harnessing international cooperation. But ultimately, what I think, it, it, it's an expression of the human spirit. Because when we look back in, in history, George, you know, ever since humans left Africa 200,000 years ago, we've had this urge to look over the horizon. So I see human space exploration as the ultimate expression of that drive that's led to us as a species colonizing the world. I know you should be on the television inspiring future generations uh, to take up this uh, issue. Truly inspiring and, and brilliant. Thanks very much for Thank joining you, us. Well, it's been a hundred shows. We've had everybody orbiting the world on Sputnik with us. 
conservatives, Labour, Liberal Democrats, members of the House of Lords, House of Commons, OBEs, MBEs, past presidents, even one serving president. But we asked on the social media, who was your favourite guest? What was rattling, Gayatri? Well, we've got lots of response on that big question. Of course, they have 99 shows, so lots and lots of guests. David Thomas says, mentions Patrick Coburn, Harry Fair, and Lee Jasper. But your guests, on the whole, in my opinion, contribute illumination and learning. Ricardo Picasso says, never a forgetful episode, but Seamus Mill is always a good guest. The right-wing media are busily digging up his appearances on here, <laughs> see if they've got anything they can use against Jeremy Corbyn. Yeah, I know. And and Joe says David Norris, he was superb. And that's all that we've got time for this week. Which, alas, means that's the end of the 100th show. Stay in touch with us for the next 100 shows on Twitter at RT underscore Sputnik or on Facebook, Sputnik on Russia Today. It's goodbye this time from me, Gayatri. And from me, George Galloway. It's really been marvellous. <laughs>